Good morning and welcome on a beautiful June day. Glad that you could be here for any that I may not have met. I'm Alan and uh, it's a pleasure to take my turn along with Sandy and Nick and with uh, uh, someone named Cheryl who's the coordinating lead minister in this endeavor and uh, to join us in worship today. Uh, uh, good to be working with Michael once again with his gift of music and the music ministry that happens in this place. Welcome. Good to see you. So, uh, as is our custom here, we start off early on with uh, naming celebrations. Are there any birthdays, for instance, to be celebrated? Are there any anniversaries to be celebrated? Congratulations to you both. <laughs> My grandson's graduating Wednesday, too, from Claremont, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, he's had my granddaughter graduated from Vic last Friday, mm -hmm. um, a week ago Friday, with a degree in um, Bachelor of Science in Biology and Psychology. Uh -huh. but, well, you know, I think we need to modify that happy birthday to <laughs> <laughs> happy graduation. You <laughs> forgot, Mary. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you, pardon. 18 years ago, I had grandchildren due in Toronto and New Westminster. On the 4th and 5th of January, they arrived 7th and 10th. They graduated, but the grandson last Thursday, the ceremony, granddaughter ceremony this evening. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> my Glad we got that included. We got other graduations. Uh, got, uh, yeah, uh, actually, Lillian Davidson's birthday is 90th birthday coming up on Saturday. Oh. Yeah, next Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. She's not being here because she is singing uh, Carol. Yeah. But, uh, but she's here in spirit. Right. Yeah. So let's sing a happy birthday for Lillian first, and then we're going to sing uh, the graduation, too. <laughs> <laughs>
because they had these different backgrounds and different ideas, they, they were not just tolerant with one another. They also celebrated the diversity that was in their midst. And uh, that's something that I think continues to be of the United Canada when it's at its best. So, special celebration. And uh, announcements now? Gilda uh, has a special announcement. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rhoda Cotton. Um, I'm a retired minister in the United Church, um, but that's not why I'm standing here. Um, in the late 1990s, I came here as a student minister, as many of you remember, with Reverend Terry Finch. And if you were here then, you know what a wonderful man he was. A wonderful minister and a wonderful teacher, and he taught me so much. Um, one of the things he taught me was to project, project, project. <laughs> that was his quote, and I'll never um, forget that about him. Um, the reason that I'm standing up here, I want to thank the congregation of, to me, Shady and Brentwood Bay, who took me in with open arms, uh, loved me, supported me, and um, just were so open to my journey. Uh, I had a wonderful time at school. I went to BST for many years, most of you don't know. I learned so much there, it just my mind exploded with all the learning professors, other students. And then we were sent out on internships, and I came here twice. I was only supposed to come once because you're supposed to go to a different church the second time, you know, different experiences. But Terry and some of the congregation, I don't know who, but some of the congregation wrote a letter to BST and asked if I could stay on for the second term. And they granted permission. So I was still here when I graduated in 2000, and you threw a wonderful party for me at Brentwood Day. And I still have those banners and the posters, you know, of me. And some of you are still here, and I know I'll miss people, but Helen, Miriam, And so for those who aren't here today, um, but you, you know, you can just give them a phone call or express my thanks. I know I'm late in doing this, but I want to thank you personally for taking me into your hearts. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words, Wilbur. And, and Congratulations on, is this the 24th anniversary of your ordination? I guess so. Yeah. <laughs>
students uh, here in this uh, congregation, we want to note that as we begin, we acknowledge that Central Saanich United Church is located on the traditional territories of the Saanich peoples and our neighbors with the Startlip and Sayrut peoples on whose traditional territories we live, learn, play, and work. We acknowledge that the historical relationship to the land and the territories of these peoples continues to this day. And if you haven't looked at your Morning Times columnist today, this was on the front page. It's also on the website. And it's uh, celebrating with uh, the Tlay uh, Will Nuke Tribal School of Sartlet. Uh, this is uh, marking uh, graduation mm -hmm. again and uh, their effort to have the language, uh, the Saanich uh, language being learned by their children. Uh, I was reading, it's an interesting article there because I think it's still grade four or so that they're taught in that language only and then they bring in the English, something of that nature. And now the lead class is going into grade 11 this September. And of course they're located very close to where we gather and worship today. Uh, so I commend to you your reading. Uh, go to the website if you don't get uh, Times Columnist and, and read the article and uh, we can learn more about our neighbors there and we can join in celebrating that with them because as you read the article you see just how significant this is for them and uh, what major strides it has signified for them. So, uh, <coughs> yes? Can I just make a, a little quick comment about their language? And that was the drum. I believe is Charles Elliott's brother, and most people know Charles Elliott as a, a card who passed away this past year. Their father is the one who uh, designed the writing for their language. Before that, they didn't have it. And uh, most of the people in, in the Elliott family have been working really hard to bring that language back alive. So I thought since his picture was there, I would mention that. Thank you so much, Eric. So we continue with our worship, the lighting of the Christ candle. so well that I sometimes somehow hopped over it in the service, but we're going to get to sing it now because it's an opening hymn of thanksgiving and praise. Uh, so uh, I invite you to join in the singing there.
much of the liturgy is drawn from the worship resources of the United Church of Canada, <coughs> and often it's in a responsive mode where anything in bold is the part of the congregation, uh, except for titles. So, we'll keep that there. so in our opening words, in our worship today, we joined with many United Churches in celebrating Pride Sunday. In 1988, the United Church of Canada decided that sexual orientation would no longer be a barrier to membership in the United Church and hence to candidacy for ministry. In 2009, gender identity was added to that decision. Some of us come to a day celebrating and knowing lots about pride. Some come to a celebrating and knowing little about pride. is a positive stance against discrimination and violence towards lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and gender fluid people. Pride is also a chance to promote self-affirmation, dignity, equality, and fundamental human rights, and to celebrate in a safe environment. We pray when you called each of us into being, you delighted in your works. You gifted us with differences that eliminate the breadth of beauty, wisdom, and practices of love in your creation. In whatever ways we still struggle to accept and celebrate our own unique offerings and the offerings of others, free us from narrow thinking that confines and constrains your good work. Open our hearts that we celebrate the diversity both within and among us. Amen. Come touch our hearts.
Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, what a way to introduce what the theme is for today, fear and faith. <coughs> today being Pride Sunday, there are an infinite number of stories that could be told. And we've heard many of those stories told by you folk right here, various Sundays in recent years. Today, we share one story. It appeared in McLean's magazine very recently, as a story by Abby Tickle, My Trans Awakening at Age 66. And uh, this is a somewhat shortened, abbreviated version of what appears in McLean's. I was 10 years old when the first time I came out as transgender. It was 1964, and I told my parents I was a girl. They didn't know how to react. Back then, such things were considered a perversion. My father's reaction was to continue shaming me for who I was, a gentle child who cried easily. So I never brought it up with them again. I learned how to walk like a boy, how to talk like a boy, even think like a boy. I wasn't very good at it when I was younger, but I got better as the years went by. Decades later, after my grown sons and stepdaughter had moved out, my wife and I retired and ended up in a community just outside the Calgary. For years, I never dared look up the word transgender online. I was afraid that someone would find it in my search history and that I'd be outed. I never believed it was possible to come up. But as life went on, and I could start to see the end of the road, I wondered whether I could actually be the person I truly am. I imagined myself on my deathbed, still in the closet, thinking, I'd never live. And that was heartbreaking. In 2001, 2021, one day, I typed transgender into Facebook's search bar. I was shocked to find there were so many Facebook groups for trans people online. Some had over 100,000 members. People talked about going on hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, about getting gender-affirming surgery, about coming out to their families. I was blown away. I had no idea these things were present. And I realized I could not stay in the closet anymore. At the age of 66, I came out to my wife. She had no idea that I was trans. That's how well hidden it was. The news became the start of a slow motion divorce. But for me, telling her the truth lifted a tremendous weight off my shoulders. And by joining trans Facebook groups, people were encouraging, and they told me about their own coming out experiences. A few months later, I came out to my sons and my daughter-in-law, my, my stepdaughter. They didn't see it coming, but they were very supportive. My grandkids in particular have been great. They used to call me grandpa. And one day I said to them, I'd like you to call me granny now. And just like that, they switched over without missing a beat. By then, my wife had accepted but she couldn't have changed my transness, and she decided to help me move forward in very practical ways. She gave me advice about painting my nails, <laughs> about adopting a skincare routine, about styling my clothes, and I greatly appreciated her help. I started seeing a therapist who, who told me about Skipping Stone. It's a nonprofit organization in Calgary that supports trans people and organizes Zoom's peer support groups. So I joined one for trans feminine people over the age of 50. And those first meetings were a shock because I'd never met a trans person before <laughs> or 
so I thought. There was so much to process. Most of the members had been out for years, and they had answers to my questions. Over time, my wife and I finalized our divorce and moved into separate apartments in Calgary. I felt more free to express my gender identity. I put on a blouse, a skirt, jewelry, and makeup, and then I danced around the living room in a way I'd never moved before, never allowed myself to move before, like a girl. And it filled me with joy. I also changed my name and my gender marker and my ID. In September of 2022, I attended a picnic with the Zoom group. We met in the parking lot, all of us dressed up for a day in the park. There were a few people standing near us who weren't part of our group, and the funny thing was, none of them paid much attention to us. At that moment, we were just like everyone else. And that was a powerful lesson. It inspired us to get together more often, and I realized we could be exactly who we were in public. And we probably wouldn't get stares or nasty comments. We started going out for lunch. We could be ourselves with each other. Queer people, especially trans people of my generation, have done a lot of hiding in our lives. And it's so very nice to find a group that is out and about, as you might say, in the community. Nowadays, a group called Rainbow Elders has become a focus of my life. Among other things, the group advocates for qu uh, queer seniors in care homes. They put together seminars for the staff and the residents alike. I've now been out for three years, and at this point, my transition is largely complete. I am profoundly happier now. I used to be a, a quiet person who, who rarely smiled and barely had any friends. Now I wake up every morning looking forward to what's ahead. I'm finally the person I always was. the scandal now be a sign of the prayer that has already begun. May we each find ways to continue the prayer in the month ahead. One of our readers will share with us about the United Church in the world. And if the children want to come with me, they can go downstairs to the Sunday school. We're going to learn about Samuel. We are blessed to live in Canada, a country that recognizes the right to love whoever you want regardless of their gender or sex, but those rights to do not exist in many parts of the world today. One of our partners in Kenya has advocated strongly for the human rights of sexual minorities, and that has caused him to be in jail, caused him to risk his life. So says the Reverend Michael Blair, the church's first openly gay general secretary. He is glad our church now is helping to advocate for sexual and gender minorities in foreign countries. Michael says, when we hear these stories, we can see that this is the life and death of matter. Same-sex attraction is a crime in 71 countries, and 11 of them have 
the death penalty. The United Church of Mission and Service helps shelter refugees as they escape their oppressive governments. Mission and Service also holds consultations in other countries to discover how we can be work with our partners to protect sexual and gender minorities. To date, Mission and Service has supported consultations in Latin America and the Philippines. The United Church is helping to protect sexual and gender minorities. Let us join in singing deep in our hearts. gospel lesson about Jesus calming the storm is a story about faith and fear. Sharon Salzberg, the author and Buddhist teacher, writes, faith demands that despite our fear, we get as close as possible to the truth of the present moment so that we can offer our hearts fully to it with integrity. Faith is willing to engage the unknown, not shrink back from it. Faith doesn't mean the absence of fear. It means having the energy to go ahead, right alongside the fear. 
the courage we openly acknowledge what we can't control and place our hearts wisely on our ability to connect with the truth of the moment and to move forward into the uncharted terrain of the next moment. Desmond Tutu once spoke of the importance of faith this way. If it weren't for faith, I would have given up long ago. I am certain lots of us would have been hate-filled and bitter. For me, the scriptures have become more and more thoroughly relevant to our situation. Tutu then spoke about a surprising aspect of the scriptures. He said, the scriptures speak of a God who, when you worship this God, turns you around to be concerned for your neighbor. Our God does not tolerate our trying to have a relationship with the Creator that excludes your neighbor. We give thanks for these readings from Scripture and from the world around us. There is room for all. for our hearts to name. The sun comes up, a new day's dawning. It's time to sing your song again. And whatever may pass, whatever lies before us, let us still be singing when the evening comes. Amen. Friends, the, the Sea of Galilee is a relatively small body of water, usually quite calm. And yet, with very little warning, all of a sudden there can be a, a great and fierce windstorm descend. Uh, this painting that depicts the storm that uh, the disciples experienced in our Gospel reading today, in it, the master Dutch artist Rembrandt he chooses to recast the scene into his own context. And so instead of that quaint little fishing boat in uh, Galilee 2,000 years ago, it's been transformed into a, a pretty Im impressive uh, sailboat, 17th century Holland. And you see there how it's now buffeted and it's in a turmoil on the Atlantic Ocean, not in Galilee. I love it because I think that's what we should be always doing with the scripture reading, is looking at how that speaks to us in our own context. And I imagine it must have been quite a stunning thing for his peers to see the painting he produced. And it is a storm in that painting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, can you see uh, the, how the 
waves are coming over the bow, smashing against the ship. There's a, the sail is torn. There's even some rocks. It's getting dangerously close to where it could all split up. And no wonder those disciples were so afraid. And no wonder, in fact, there's, there's one of them, the fellow in the red down at the bottom here. Is he over the side? You know, any moment now, it looks like he's going to lose his lunch. And so much more was at risk of being lost that day. As with seas, so in life. Storms can come unannounced in our lives. Or maybe we see some signs of a storm approaching. A disappointing medical report, a financial setback, or some sort of turmoil in our relationships, and the list goes on. And so we too can be like those disciples feeling overwhelmed by whatever that storm may be in our lives. Swamped. And adding to the distress of these disciples is an additional problem. And the problem is that their vision has become distorted. What do I mean by that? Their vision has become distorted because now they're looking 100% at the storm and nothing else. And that only intensifies their uh, anxiety. So when Jesus finally arises from where he's been sleeping, he doesn't say to them, have no fear. Instead, he asks them to examine their fear. Why are you afraid? And why are you letting that storm take full control of your life? Nice to have someone asking questions like that from time to time, I think. And so he not only asks those questions, he also invites them to refocus. And he asks, do you not have some faith? I mean, even a little faith, as little as a mustard seed, that's all that's required. What would it mean to us to have faith of a mustard seed? Well, you know, faith does not mean that life is going to go smoothly. It doesn't mean that God's going to spare us from all harm. Human experience will underline that that just ain't so. Storms come, and considerable damage can be done. But surely what it does mean, I believe, is if we say that we have faith, even a mustard seed's worth of it, then we believe that God is resilient, that God perseveres through the storm, whatever the storm may be. And by the grace of God, we are given the gift of resilience and endurance in those storms as well. Now think of, uh, think of Desmond Tutu, uh, the incredible faith that he embodied throughout his life. Got him through all sorts of turmoil. In the quote we heard just a moment ago, Tutu tells not only how the scriptures have sustained him in his life, he also says how he learned from the scriptures. A very important lesson. He learned that God isn't very interested in nurturing a relationship with us if we persistently ignore our neighbor. You heard that. Did that strike you as, whoa, it did for me when it came across it, and that's why we heard it today. Imagine that God isn't that concerned, he said, about nurturing a relationship with him if he continues to ignore his neighbor. So, hey, you know, the love of God and the love of neighbor, they're intimately interrelated. And faith is a gift that not only gives us the ability to endure through the storms in our lives, it's a double gift because it also gives us the blessing of being able to befriend and accompany our neighbor 
as that person goes to whatever storm may arise. And when storms of prejudice impact others and not ourselves, it can be very tempting for us to want to step aside and stay out of the fray. But such storms are not to be ignored. And so, for instance, early on in, in the Pride movement, very early on in the Pride movement, years and years ago, some people started to appear who became known as allies. And they weren't the ones who were the prime targets of the abuse and the uh, discrimination, the violence and the threats. But they were deeply concerned and caring about those who were. That was years ago. And now, thank goodness, we've come to a point where together we can celebrate the gains that have been won, the human rights that have been won, the hurdles that have been overcome. At the same time, together, we also need to keep alert, keep vigilant about storm clouds that still appear. Look one last time at that painting. You see a small figure here, this one, the one who's holding on to a rope to steady himself. Who do you think that might be? It's the Dutch master himself. It's Rembrandt. Isn't that something? Think about it. He's, even though he's a painter, he's not going to be the dash way over here. Instead, there he is, right in the midst of his own painting, right in the midst of the storm. I think about that, and I think about how when a neighbor of ours experienced a storm that is hurtful, when a neighbor of ours experiences a storm that is unjust, we may not be able to tell them, well, we're sure it's going to abate within so many months or whatever. But nevertheless, we can tell them, well then, I'm going to step in and stand with you in the face of that storm. Just like Rembrandt, joining them in the midst of it. And that's the commitment that Jan Richardson offers in one of the blessings she writes. In that blessing she says, I cannot claim to still the storm that has seized you. Cannot calm the waves that break against you. But I will wade into these waters. Will stand with you in the storm will say, peace to you in the waves, peace to you in the wind, peace to you in every moment that finds you still within the storm, whatever that storm might be. Friends, this is a blessing that you and I can choose to live out. We can choose to wade into the waters, to stand with our neighbor, to offer respect and compassion, and a peace that is present even in the midst of the very worst of storms. Thanks be to God. Now are you ready for some fancy footwork? <laughs> One more step.